Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> I had a really difficult problem sleeping Friday night. And um, I thought it was because Joanna fell asleep downstairs, so as she often does. And so I'm upstairs and I call out to her, Joanna, wake up. Okay. An hour go by, she's still not up. Joanna, wake up. So anyway, this goes on to like. <laughs> up in the morning and realized, not because, because I was worried about Joanna, that wasn't the really word, it was because God was prompting me to speak on something else that has been in my heart for the last couple of weeks. So yesterday morning, I, I got up and um, I decided to scratch my entire sermon that I've been working on and planned for this week. And um, I don't even have a title for this message. So I apologize. And, um, but it's just something that I felt really strong that God goes to my heart. I feel that it is something that is important enough for the church community for us to really have clarity, clarity For the past two weeks, we have all witnessed the horrific conflict in Israel. And since then, protests, absolute chaos, has broken out all over the world. There were wars and rumors of wars and fear, death, suffering, unimaginable pain that the people of that region are experiencing. Emotions are high and people are angry and rightfully so. So the question this morning I'm asking you is how are you sitting on all of this in your heart? As we come together this morning, how does God want us to respond to what does God want us to hear from him this morning? One thing I know is that we need to be praying for the people of Israel, for the innocent Palestinians who are caught in the crossfires of this war. We need to pray for peace. We need to pray for safe passage for the innocent before the ground war starts. And we need to pray for the eradication of evil. And we need to pray for the hand of God to move in the heart of people throughout the world to see the truth. That is my hope this morning. I am going to attempt to answer three questions today. There are ideological answers to these, and there are geopolitical answers and philosophical answers to these, and even religious answers. But today I'm going to give you the biblical, the spiritual, and the historic answer to this conflict as we see unfold in the Middle East. I've come to this clarity is that why do I feel so compelled to talk about this this morning? And the reason is that as a Christian that we must understand this from the Word of God and have moral clarity over this issue without doubt. So the three questions that I'm going to attempt to answer this morning are these. Number one, why is Hamas so intent on destroying Israel and the Jewish people? Number two, what is the history of the Palestinians and the land of Israel? Number three, where are there so many people supporting Palestinian causes today. Israel. 
Father, this is a difficult message to speak of because of the history and the geopolitical conflicts of all the messiness that has been going on in that land for so, so many years. Father, we pray for clarity this morning. We pray for your light to shine through, for your spirit to open our eyes and enlighten our hearts so we may see the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about from a biblical perspective. Biblical perspective. First, we can trace the animosity and the root of this conflict all the way back to the book of Genesis, to Abraham. Abraham had a son with his wife, Sarah, named Isaac. However, in a moment of weakness, Abraham had an affair with a slave woman from Egypt named Hagar. And she gave birth to a son named Ishmael, which was not in the will of God. The descendants of Ishmael are the Arabs people, and the descendants of Isaac, according to the will and the covenant of God, are the Jewish people. Okay, we're clear on that? So there has been animosity between the children of Ishmael and the children of Isaac since the beginning of time, all over the jealousy of the promise. And what is the promise? It's the promise that through the bloodline of Abraham and Sarah, there will be established a nation of God's people. Let me say that again. That through the bloodline of Abraham and Sarah, they will be established a nation of God's people. This is the original conflict in a nutshell. However, to be more specific, spiritually, spiritually, the vitriol, the hate, the animosity, the desire to wipe the nation of Israel off the face of the planet is much deeper than this. It is satanic. It is evil at work. The hatred of the Jewish people throughout history is incited by evil itself. I'd like to read to you from Revelation chapter 12, verse 4. As you know that the book of Revelation is a prophecy of the end times. And uh, in this particular passage, it says, And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth to a child, and the dragon is ready to devour the child as soon as he is born. What does this speak of? In Revelation 12, 4, there is a woman, a dragon, and a child. The dragon is a picture of Satan. The woman is a picture of Israel. And the child she gives birth to is the ultimate child of the promise, which is Jesus. Satan, the dragon, has always stood opposed to the redemptive plan of God. Throughout history, he has done everything to hinder, to impede, to obstruct, and to ruin the redemptive plan of God, which is to be revealed through a particular people and nations. Are you with me? So what is that plan? God's redemptive plan is this. It is God's love for mankind to restore and reconcile sinful man to a holy God through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of his son Jesus. That's it. That is the story of the entire Bible from beginning to end. It is a love story of a loving God reconciling sinful man to himself. 
Humanity in our sinful nature needed a savior to rescue all of us. So God in his providence chose Abraham. Abraham was a Gentile. He was not a Jew. Actually, there was no Jewish people at all at the time. Abraham was living in, on the map today, Iraq. God called him to leave his home and come to a land that through his descendants, a people and a nation and a savior will be born, which is the Jewish people. And ultimately, through this race of people and nation, will come this Messiah, who will be the Savior, not just for the Jewish people, but for all of mankind. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that all who believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is a redemptive plan of God. That through Abraham and the Jewish nation to bring a savior to the world. Satan, on the other hand, hates this plan. He hates the land of Israel. Why? Because the redemptive plan of God is located and centered in Israel. Where the Savior was born, where the Savior died, where the Savior rose again, and where the Savior ascended to heaven, and where the Savior will come again to the land of Israel. Satan is doing everything he can to bring the attention of this evil world with all of its chaos, all of its hatred, all of his animosity into this one location because it represents the covenant of God to his people and the redemptive plan of God for mankind. Do you understand? This is so important to understand. Why this land is so important to God, but why it's so important to Satan. Satan has been inspiring nations and people from the beginning of time to hate the Jewish people because they are God's chosen people. God says in Genesis, the first book of the Bible, 12.3, I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel. God's eyes is on this land because he chose this particular location among a particular people to reveal his ultimate redemptive plan for the sake of the entire world. So if you have ever wondered in recent weeks why all the hate for the Jewish people, why all the fuss over a small piece of land 20 times smaller than California, that is where it came from. This is a spiritual war that we are seeing happening fought in physical ways. A spiritual war that's incited by evil. There is a populist response to this conflict. We hear this narrative everywhere on television, social media, now on college campuses, in protests, in support, of, in support of Palestine, and on the elimination of the Jewish state. The narrative is that the Israel is the occupying nation in this land, which they stole from the Palestinian people. The Jews are called colonizers, occupiers, settlers. These are the words of the protests heard around the world against the nation of Israel, proclaiming the Jewish people are illegitimate owners of this land and stole the land from the Palestinians, and the Palestinians alone are the sovereign and rightful owners of this land. This leads to our second question this morning. 
What is the history of the Palestinians to the land of Israel? What is the history of the Palestinians to the land of Israel? Let me begin by saying this. The Jewish people are not occupiers. If you know history, the Jewish people are the indigenous people of this land. When we think of indigenous people, we think of their deep roots and heritage and connection to the land that they inhabited, right? Often for centuries and even millennia. For example, the Chinese are from, it's not a test, China, thank you. I hope. Good job, man. Egyptians are from, Indians are from, not North America, India. That's, I was getting that. And the Japanese are from Japan, right? So imagine with me, imagine with me that the Native American Indians from the Cherokee Nations who currently occupy 7,000 square miles of tribal land in northeast Oklahoma. They were relocated there in 1838. Are they colonizers of that land? No. They are Native Americans. It is their land from the beginning. The Cherokee Nation used to be in Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, and Oklahoma, and was forced to move entirely into Oklahoma. No one dares to call them occupiers or colonizers. Now what about the Jews? When did their identity and heritage to the land of Judea, which is modern day Israel today, begin? When did that begin? The Old Testament was written in a span of over 4,000 years. From Genesis, the first book of the Bible, to the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. They are references to the promised land in Jerusalem, land that God gave to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Land that God promised to the Jewish people as he delivered them out of Egypt. And here are just a few. In Genesis 12, 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, to your offering I will give you this land. In Genesis 15, 18, God said to Abraham, to your descendants I have given this land from the river of Egypt as far as the great river of Euphrates. Genesis 13, 14, 15. The Lord said to Abram, lift up your eyes and look from the east where you are, northwest and southwest and eastwards and westward. For all the land that you will see, I will give you into your offsprings forever. In Exodus 3, 8, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and fertile land, a land of flowing milk and honey. Deuteronomy 6, 3, hear, O Israel, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your father, has promised you in a land flowing milk with milk and honey. In 2 Chronicles 6.6, 6, But I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there, that I have chosen David to be over my people of Israel. In Zacharias 8.3, Thus say the Lord, I have returned to Zion, and I will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem shall be called the faithful city, the mountain of the Lord, and the holy mountain. In the Deuteronomy 11.12, Jerusalem, the land the Lord your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to the end. Why are those passages important? 
because the Jewish people, according to the Bible, they were living in this land for 2,100 years before anyone was ever called or referred to as Palestinians. 2,100 years. And they were living in that land 2,600 years before Islam was ever even a religion. To put it in context, just so you understand, the Islamic religion did not exist until 500 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, for those who do not embrace and believe the Bible as a historic record, a fact that Jews were living in this land through thousands and thousands of years before the Palestinians or thousands of years before the start of Islamic religion, then at least take a look at the archaeological evidence. If you were to throw a rock anywhere in the land of Israel, you will find Jewish heritage, you will find archaeology digs throughout the land of Israel, and every square inch of it has a legacy and identity of the Israeli people. Do you know there are Egyptian tablets going back to 1300 BC? Do you know how long ago that is? 3,322 years ago. Egyptian tablets that speaks of Israel by name as the land of the Jewish people, going back 3,300 years. As well as Canaanite tablets found in 900 BC, that is 2,900 years old, year old. That name King David is a king of the land of of Israel. Why is that important? Because Jesus is a direct descendant of King David. God's redemptive plan is a people, a nation, and a savior. So for those who don't believe in the Bible, at least look at the archaeological evidence that for thousands of years, the Jewish people had lived in this land as God has given it to them. So the question here this morning is, what happened? So here is the history part of it, conversation. Sorry, it feels more like a history lesson than a sermon, but... Why is there confusion as to the Jewish identity to this land? Why do others claim the rights to this land and say this land belongs to the Palestinians and not the Jewish people? From 586 B.C., when the Babylonians attacked Israel until 1948, after World War II, when the nation of Israel asserted their rights to their homeland granted by the United Nations, during that time period of over 2,500 years, the Jews were displaced from their homeland. They were persecuted, they were killed, and they were oppressed around the world. Much of the Jews... Jewish population managed to stay in their homeland, but the land was dominated by other world empires. Here's a list. After the Jewish people has been dispersed from their land, Judea was controlled first by the Babylonians, and then the Persians, and then the Greeks, and then the Romans, and then the Arabs, and then the Catholic Crusaders, and then the Ottomans, and then by the British Empire. It is exactly because of this reason, after thousands of years being dominated by all of these empires, there is an argument that this is my land. No, this is mine. No, this is mine. Do you, do you see it now? Because of 
different empire has occupied that land. Because various nations has once occupied that land, for us, we must have clarity to know that the Jews were there before any of these empires had occupied that land. So in the midst of this, where did the Palestinians come from? Where did the Palestinians come from? Where did the word even derive from? A little more history. In 135 AD, basically 135 years after the death of Jesus, the Roman emperor, Hadrian, in order to quash a Jewish revolt, to overthrow the Roman Empire, or the Roman governing body at that time for the land of Judea, he quashed a Jewish revolt. As a result of that, he dispersed the Jews from Jerusalem. He basically gathered all the Jews in the land of Judea and cast them out. Cast them out of the land of Israel. And renamed the entire region in Latin, Palatina. He named it Palatina because that is the Latin word for Philistine. Philistine, if you remember, they are the arch enemy of the Jews. So Hadrian, to dishonor the Jews, angry that the Jewish people tried to reclaim their land in an attempt to overthrow the Romans governing Judea, Judea at the time. So after they, he quashed the revolt, he took away the name of Israel from all of the land and renamed it Palestina. And it gave the land to the Philistines, Jewish people's enemy, in order to dishonor the Jewish people. So from 135 AD to 1948, the Jew, when the Jewish people finally returned to their homeland and gave it its rightful name, Israel, so for a period of about 1,800 years, it was called Palestine. And all of this because Hadrian renamed it. So for all the Arabs that lived in that land, they became Palestinians. Everybody good? Understand that? Okay. I know this morning feels a little more like a history lesson than a sermon, but we must have clarity on this issue. The Jewish people are not colonizers or occupiers of this land. Over 4,000 years ago, God gave the deed of this land to the descendants of Abraham, which are the Jewish people. So question three this morning is why are so many people then supporting the Palestinian cause today? Our college campuses are on fire. Cities all over the world are on fire with this particular issue. We have been seeing protests, marching on the streets, inciting violence against the Jewish people, calling for the elimination of the Jewish state, particularly... Why are so many young people supporting the cause of the Palestinian state? First, I would like to offer a word of encouragement, then I'm going to give you some truth. It is encouraging to see this generation of young people today passionate about justice and humanitarian causes. They are concerned about the underdog, the marginalized people who are without a voice. Young people should be commended for that. And you shouldn't ever stop caring for people who are disadvantaged. As a matter of fact, in my work today, kind of a, a tech startup aimed at giving voice to the marginalized and even, you know, try to even the feel in terms of making theological education more accessible and affordable to the less fortunate. So I understand their hearts, I understand their passion. That is a space that I live in. 
But it is this need for justice for people. It is this need for justice for people to quickly jump on certain causes that you are passionate about. You know, you want to see, you know, an end to sex trafficking. You want to see an end to world hunger. You you care about the planet and so on. That's all incredible, and we all should be like you. So don't ever stop caring about people. Compassion is needed in the world. But here's the challenge. The passion that you have for these causes can often be misguided. Can often be misguided. We must know and have clarity on why we are part of that cause. And we need to get our facts straight. Sometimes we are so quick to jump on the bandwagon on the latest issue, on the latest cost, the latest group that seemed disadvantaged, that we don't even know why we are part of this cause. We can't even intellectually defend it, and we end up looking silly. Brothers and sisters, we must do our homework. We must be diligent in our understanding of this issue that we care about. Most people today don't even know the history of this land of Israel that I'm talking about to you today. Without getting the facts and understanding the history and the word of God, we ended up just be believing in a false narrative that's going on in the world today. The Jews are the colonizers. They're the occupiers. We need to eradicate the Jews from this land. This land become, belongs to the Palestinians. You know what? We need to have compassion for the Palestinians. We need to care and pray for them. What is happening there is horrible on both sides. And I believe the majority of Palestinians just want to live in peace. But understand something. The nation of Israel has a right to defend their land and their people. Around the land of Israel, there are 22 Arab states, 52 Muslim states, and only one Jewish state. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East surrounded by enemies committed to their destruction. I want to be clear this morning. I am not here to defend Israel for what they have done since 1948. It is unfortunate because the way that they resettled in that land was messy and it was terrible for the Palestinian people, and Israel should be held accountable for that. However, this is not a geopolitical conflict conversation. But to say that the land belongs to the Palestinians and the Jews has never been there until they marched into that land in 1948 by force and took it from the Palestinians is simply intellectually dishonest. And it isn't true. Today in our society and around the world, what feeds, feeds a lot of people to jump on these humanitarian causes so easily is because it makes them feel good. We all have a guilty conscience, and the only way to really sway your guilty conscience is go to God and have your forgiveness through Jesus. But what happens is for some people, in order to sway their guilty consciences, they take up good causes. A lot of people end up being caught up in what is called a moralistic therapeutic deism. Sorry, that's a big word even for me. What is that? In 2005, a Harvard doctor named Christian Smith coined the phrase moralistic therapeutic deism to describe a generation that is making God out of humanitarian causes. What does that mean? The moralistic part is, I want to do good. Fine. And then when I do good, I feel good. That is the therapeutic part. 
Then you let that cause consume you and you make a God out of it. That is the deism part. It is a dangerous place to be because you begin to jump on the bandwagon of the latest cause, the latest humanitarian thing. You haven't done your homework. You don't know your facts and you can't intellectual defend, intellectually defend it. And you look silly. All right, I'm letting it all out today, right? A couple of years ago during the BLM riots, BLM was the rage, man. Everybody's wearing BLM t-shirts. You know, players refused to stand, wearing BLM t-shirts, refused to stand for the national anthem, right? People are posting black boxes on their Instagram to support BLM. My church even did that in the northern, in, up north. We had to have a conversation with our pastors. Like, what, what? You know? My seminary that I worked for had a big BLM flag hanging on their wall. Outside. It was all the rage. Everybody was jumping on that cause. Right? Hundreds and hundreds of million dollars poured in to this organization. However, if you just do a little bit of homework, and I'm not talking about the fine print, you just go to their website and look at their charter, their mission, and one of the mission is the destruction of the nuclear family. It is a Marxist theory. The destruction of the nuclear family. Are you in support of that? All you have to do is do a little bit of homework. When I ask people about that, when I explain that to them, I said, do you still support BLM? They're like, oh, well, uh, I support this BLM, but not that one. Whatever. I don't even know what that means. Right? This is what I mean. Right? You must have clarity on these issues. My recommendation is this, is that to check your relationship with Jesus, to get your feel good from God. Stay close to Jesus and get into a right relationship with Jesus, and then you will know what is right, what is good, and what is pure. Brothers and sisters, my intent today is simply to provide you with some context and some clarity on this conflict from a biblical, spiritual, and historic perspective as he has laid these words in my heart. But Christians, we must have moral clarity on this issue. God's work is not done. His redemptive plan for mankind is still at work. And that work will only be accomplished when his people have clarity and consecrated themselves at the feet of Jesus and walk in the fullness of Christ. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, may we be people, people of faith that's rested in your words and your truth. May we have clarity on the things that we feel is important. May we seek your wisdom. May we seek you first in our lives, that you are the joy of our hearts. Father, we pray for the region, for the Palestinian people who are caught in the crossfires, for the innocent, for the Jewish people. Father, we pray for peace in this place. Because this place that you have deeded to the Jewish people and this place is important to you. Pray for your protection, Lord, among the Jewish people and the Palestinian, the innocent Palestinian people. Father, we ask for your lead and your guidance in, in terms of how we should respond. But Lord, let our faith be rooted in your word and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen.